You know, we all lead stressful lives these days, and if you're looking for a chill pill to take, don't take power. This is not the pill for you. Howdy, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insight into the creative process of storytelling. You know, folks, today, I'm very happy to have with me Matson Tomlin to discuss Project Power. It's, it's his latest uh, screenplay, and, and, and it's his latest film, and you could watch it on Netflix. So you, you technically have it in your pocket right now. And uh, we had a really good chat about what it took for Matson to create his own superhero franchise uh, because he knew he wouldn't probably be able to become a writer on existing IP. And he created this, this, this film, which got onto the blacklist in 2016 as Power. That was, that was the title then. And it's now obviously titled Project Power. And uh, we had a really good chat about his creative habits, his process, and what it took to get this made. So I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, I hope you'll check out Backstory Magazine. That's right. It's my passion project. You could find it over at Backstory.net. And, uh, you know, it's a strange time to be publishing a film magazine without films in theaters. So we are building issue 42, our, our awesome quarantine read. And it's going to have a lot of things in it that are both kind of coming into theaters, kind of streaming, kind of being released. It's going to have retros. It's also going to have what has always been my mission statement with Backstory, which is great unproduced screenplays. Screenplays that are sitting on a shelf that deserve to be made. We publish a blacklist screenplay every issue, actually, as a matter of fact. And we accompany it by an interview. So there's just so many great things to read in there. And now more than ever, we could really use your support. So I hope you'll consider subscribing to Backstory Magazine. And if you want to, you could use coupon code SAVE5. That's the word save, the number five, and that'll save you $5 off a one-year subscription. And with your one-year subscription, you could look into our archive, you could read previous issues, going back about a year, a little more than that, and we are adding to our archive, so we're eventually going to get all of our issues in that darn thing, but it's just taking a lot of time and effort, So, and we're also working on our new issue, so it's kind of splitting the two up, um, but there's definitely stuff for you to read right now. Um, so I hope you check out Backstory Magazine. If you've never read us, you could test drive us by reading issue 37, which is our Avengers in-game issue. And uh, there's a lot of great stuff in there. And you know, you could read us on a desktop or laptop at backstory.net. That's where you could use your coupon code. Or you could read us through our iPad app, which is, you know, just looks beautiful on an iPad. But you cannot use your coupon code on the iPad. You have to do it at backstory.net. And then you could use your login credentials to log in to the iPad app. So. Thanks for considering supporting my passion project over at Backstory.net. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right into our podcast, Zoomcast. That's right, podcast listeners. If you don't know it, since the pandemic started, I have been Zoomcasting, taking these interviews from Zoom and putting them up on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page. So you could just find them there and watch them for free if you want, rather than just listening to them. Or you could do both, and you could compare. The sound quality should be the same, though. But without any further ado, let's jump right into our Zoomcast podcast with Matson Tomlin to discuss his Netflix film, Project Power. Okay, Matson, welcome. Uh, I'm, I'm psyched to have you today. Psyched and to be you, here. Yeah, and you know, the easiest place to start that, that's always fun is, is kind of breaking in. And I'm curious if you went to school to, to learn to be a writer or went to film school, and then what some of your early jobs were and how you broke in. Sure. Um, I, I fell in love with the idea of being in movies when I was about seven years old, six, seven years old. And it, it wasn't because I saw a movie and fell in love with it. You know, I had movies that I, I was really in love with, but it was because I, I met a film producer. It was this guy named John Hart. And John had, ju I think, just recently finished producing Boys Don't Cry. And uh, he was a, a, a friend of the family, kind of a friend of a friend situation. And he he was the per like his existence taught me that oh movies are something that are made and people do that for a job and that just seemed so cool to me i asked him for his email address this is in like the the mid 90s uh i then had to go create my own email address so that i could correspond with this guy and then i i stayed in touch with him for 10 years and 
when I was 16 years old, I interned for him while he was making uh, this this movie, Revolutionary Road. And so, be, you know, kind of being being his intern through that process was was kind of my first industry job down in New York City. Shortly after that, I went to SUNY Purchase for film. And then right after that, right on the heels, I went to the American Film Institute and, and went for directing. And it was, it was, well, after- sorry to interrupt. What years, yeah. were, what years did you go to the Institute? 2012 to 2014. Okay. And what, what was your most eye opening thing that you saw working as an intern on Revolutionary Road? Something that like a light bulb really clicked for you? You know, I, I think just how hard it is to make movies. I, I think that, that that really is the, the thing. I, I had been able to visit some other sets. My, my, first, my very, very first movie set that I was ever on was, was another movie that John was producing called The Night Listener that came out in 2006 with, with Robin Williams, Tony Collette, Sandra Oh, Bobby Cannavale. Yeah, that, I remember Murder that movie. Row, like, incredible cast. And just being able to... See, and I, I, I was probably 14 at the time, and, and I was just there for a week, but really watching how things were done. And I was just walking around that set, asking grips, like, what do you do? How do you do that? Like, talking to the DP. Like, everybody on that set was extremely kind to me for no reason whatsoever. So it was that experience on The Night Listener that was kind of the thing that that made a lot click of of the craft behind filmmaking. And then with Rev Road, I, I was not on set for that. I was, I was very much in the office rolling calls and, and having that version of an existence, which was interesting. Yeah. You, you know, uh, I always ask this to, to folks that come out of AFI because people's experiences are different. Yeah. It's, it's one of the film schools that for a while used to have a policy of not inviting people back to their second years that they chose uh, how did that affect you and your class or, or was that already kind of a thing of the past when you were there? I, it was, it was pretty much a thing of the past, but it, 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 there was this looming lore that, and I, and you know, some people didn't come back in a second year, but I, I think it had more to do with just them going, I've got this job or whatever. So I, but I think AFI does like to, to have that, guillotine hanging as if like you could you could not make the cut like i think that that's yeah. kind of fun just for like the the hogwarts story of it all um, <laughs> i've i've always found it strange so we're going to get to project power in just a second but i would i would be remiss if i didn't mention you know your 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 two films that that you had made before this based on screenplays of yours the 2008's projectionist and solomon grundy I'm sure that we could spend an hour on each of them easily, but I think it would be great if you could boil it down to this two-part question of what were two lessons that really stuck with you through the making of those, your first two films? And then we're going to get right into Project Power. Sure. I, I think that with The Projectionist, that, I made that movie when I was a senior in high school, and it, it was a huge labor of the people in my town just like coming together. And it was very Soderberghian of, you know, everybody wearing, I wore 25 hats on that movie. So with that one, it was this real feeling of, wait, I could actually do this. You know, that, that movie was the thing that got me into film school with, with Solomon Grundy. That, that was a very difficult, long production. It took years to, to put together and shooting on weekends with friends and you know, getting these, these extremely generous actors to just give me their time over and over and over and over. And that one taught me to finish what you start. Great lesson. Um, okay, let's get into Project Power. Where did, yeah. where did you, the, the worst question I could possibly ask you, where did you get the idea from? I know you've been asked this a million times, so you could, you could speed through it because I know it's the common question, but we just got to get a baseline. Sure. I, I, the, the, the realest answer is that I was trying to figure out what can I write that will actually get made. I was writing a lot of scripts. Um, I'd been on the blacklist a couple of times at this point. So I, I was legit light and, and making money in the film industry at that point. I was, I was kind of getting a steady income from, from movies that were not destined to be made. And I realized, man, I could do this for a really long time and not have a movie get made. So I, I, I started to sit down and do the math of what is Hollywood making right now? And the obvious answer was superhero movies. But I knew that, you know, 
trying to create my own superhero, you know, to do a mask and cape kind of thing. That felt like such a, a, a small target to hit because we're in love with characters that are 80 years old. And it is hard. I think that the most recent real mainstream character that has really hit and taken us all by storm is a character that's 11 years old, and that's Miles Morales. And that's still a Spider Man. And so to just you know, throw a, throw a mask on a character and, and give him a name. That seemed like instant death, but super powers there. It just occurred to me though, there's a way to do something with genre here and to drop superpowers into genres where they don't usually belong. And so it was kind of the combination of two of my favorite movies, eight mile and collateral. And if, if you put those together and drop superpowers into them, that's not a movie Marvel or DC is making. So it felt like I kind of found my own lane where I could, you know, pay homage to, to the greats, but also have a fighting chance at, at writing something that people would actually want to see. How inspired were you by, by movies like Limitless, for instance, you know, movies where there's a magic pill? Because I, I love the way that the power pill worked in this movie. And by the way, it was photographed beautifully as this glowing pill in people's mouth, which was really just cool to see because it, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure it's, CG, but I almost thought it was a practical effect a few times. So I could see it going either way with like a small LED light, but it, it yeah. looked awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, that's the guys and it's it's Mike Simmons, who's just a phenomenal DP. And I, I hope that he shoots every movie that comes out from now on. Um, you know, Limitless was was I you know I had seen it. It wasn't one of the movies that I was really studying. And, and it's funny, at, at some point, I think we were talking talking to Netflix at that point and they were like, oh, we really like the Limitless of it. And I kind of had to go, oh, I need to watch Limitless again to like see how, how, how close I am to it. And so like, yeah, I totally get the comparison. It's for sure there, like Magic Pill, 100%. It, it definitely was not the reference that was in my heart when I was trying to crack the story. It, instead, it kind of became the thing of, okay, what did this do really well and what lessons can we learn from it later on? Let's talk about your habit for a second. When you sit down to write, how important is outlining to your habit? Not, not very. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, great. There's no one way to do it. So, so yeah. do you just start writing like in screenplay form or do you crack a treatment or do you it's, just jump it's in? It's different every single time. It, it really, um, I'm, I'm not a person of habit or ritual at all. Um, so, so the one thing that I do that is consistent is that if I have an idea during the day, if I'm in the middle of a conversation with you, I'll stop and go, so sorry, and I'll take out my phone and I'll just start writing in the notes app. And I don't believe that I am, so, like, I, I know I'm not somebody that can have a thought and go, oh yeah, I'll remember that later. I won't remember it later. So instead, I'm rigorous about any little thought, any little detail, character, scene idea, a name, a funny you know, set piece, like whatever it is, can't be too big or small, I'll write it down. And then at the end of each day, I'll sit down and go through all the notes I've taken that day. And sometimes it'll be two or three, or sometimes it'll be a couple dozen and I'll rewrite them and embellish them and kind of add on to them a little bit more. So then it's not like I'm just writing down a note and then forgetting about it. I'm kind of collating it. Yeah. I mean, cause I was going to ask that cause it's so difficult. Cause you know, when I, when I interview screenwriters who use journals, right. And they're really into journaling and handwriting, oh, yeah. no. I've always wondered how do they collate it all so that they don't forget it. And most of them most of them feel like they're just getting the idea out. And yeah. then at a certain point, once they're writing, they reread their journals to see what stuck and what they missed and what they could approve on. But that's interesting that each day you collated. So when yeah. you collate your notes, I'm, this is so geeky, but do you do it into a Microsoft Word document or do you collate your notes into another note? Like, How do you keep track of what you're doing on a daily basis like that? Yeah, no, I collate it into, into other notes. And it's, it's basically... Other notes in the notes app. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. My, my notes app is crazy. It's like um, a big Russian doll. All right, go on. Basically. And, and what I'll do is there will be some notes where they won't yet have a home. It's just kind of, I don't know what this belongs to yet. It's just a thought. And so there's that pile of, of note. And then there's, oh, I, I think that this actually might belong to Project Power or this might belong to, to Little Fish or this might belong to whatever, any number of things I'm working on. So then the file for that project starts to become bigger, but it's not, it's not an outline. Instead, it's just a, a, a very schizophrenic, you know, collation of ideas that then at some point I get enough of those and I'm kind of like, 
I see what the moves are here. And I, I kind of understand the beginning, the middle and the end. And at that point, I will write. And that's, that's the, the, the most standard of my process. There have also been times where I sit down, I just get an idea, I get super excited about it, and I write it all in, in one 22-hour go. That's happened a couple of times. And then there are times where I, I will outline something to death and I'll have a 50-page outline for a 90-page a script. So it's, it, it, it really changes every single time. I'll tell you something that you might enjoy. I know our listeners will as well. There was there was an app called Wonderlist with a U, and it was bought by Microsoft, and it's now called To Do by Microsoft. It's a free app, and it basically takes your notes app, but allows you to give projects a header and notes that fall under it. So you could have something that's called Project Power, and then keep making new notes that only go in the Project Power part of To Do because you could enter as much text as you want into each of your sub notes. And yeah. it's just a, it seems like a great way to organize rather than just sequentially, which the notes app does. So to do by Microsoft, you might want to look at that. That's All a right. great, great tip. That sounds like something that might make my life easier. I, I it's made my life so much easier. Um, cause, cause, cause people think of it as a to do list, but if you're taking creative notes in it, you it's, it's great. Um, yeah. Sitting down to write, do you give yourself a schedule of a certain amount of hours a day or a page count that you want to hit? When I first started writing, um, it, it, it felt like bodybuilding to me. It felt like, okay, I've got to go to the gym and I'm super out of shape. And to, to set an expectation of I'm going to write all day, no, that's, that's really hard to do. You get tired, you lose steam. And then when you lose steam, you get frustrated. And then you have this association of writing makes me frustrated. So I don't want to do it. So when I first graduated, I bought an hourglass and I would flip that hourglass. I'd turn off the internet, put my phone in another room. And the deal I made with myself is doesn't matter good or bad bucket, just, you know, the sand is running and you've got to beat the sand. And so that was the case for a, a year or two where, you know, I'd have just a day where I would flip the hourglass once in the morning and then maybe again in the afternoon. And then one at night, so I was writing maybe three hours a day of really dedicated to it. And then at a certain point, you know, like going to the gym, suddenly it's like, I can, I can lift a little bit more now. And at a, at a certain point I abandoned the hourglass thing. I, it's, I still have it on my shelf there. I haven't touched it in years, but now I'm lucky in that I love writing so much that I don't ever have to worry about doing it because it's, it's just a default. But if I don't feel like writing at this point, I won't do it because ultimately there's something going on in my head where I'm thinking about something. And, you know, I write a little bit every day, even if it's just doing something in, in my notes app, which, which to me counts. Uh, and then there are other days where I'll, I'll log six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 hours. So it, it, okay. it just shifts. Uh, really briefly, because I, I want to get into the the meat and potatoes a little more of Project yeah. Power. But uh, when you get writer's block, how do you handle it? If you That's get it, another thing. Not you <laughs> never get it. No, I know I, I for sure get it, but I get it on kind of whatever. If I'm working on a scene or don't know what to go to, so I switch to another project. Like I just instantly, if I'm working on on something, you know, I I have two or three other projects that I can go to it at any point in time. And just switching into a totally different world with totally different characters that have totally different needs, I can start being in that world and it, and it releases some of the pressure of, I've got to get over this block. And by releasing that pressure, usually an answer comes subconsciously. So for me, the, the answer has always been, you know, just switch gears and go into another thing, but like, don't get out of the car. That makes sense. Uh, you know, what was the budget and schedule before we get into the spoilers? Of Project Power? Yeah. The budget, I don't think I'm allowed to say that. It, oh, really? I mean, okay. It's def definitely over 50. All right. Um, and then the, the schedule-wise, schedule, schedule -wise, it, the whole thing was so fast. You know, I, I, I sold it with the guys in October of 2017, and then we were shooting. So the directors were already attached? Yeah, when we when we sold okay. it. So, so the first thing that happened after I wrote the spec is that I went hunting for producing partners and found Brian Brian Unclos and Eric Newman. Uh, they they had just come out with with Bright at that time and and were about to do their overall deal with Netflix. So I I was 
pointing at Netflix, which, which felt like that's a place that will really make this movie. Then we did some work on the script altogether. Henry and Rel were attached by the summer of 2017. And so by the fall, we, were, we sold it to Netflix. And it was 10, 11 months later that we were shooting, which is an extremely fast turnaround. And then yeah. it was a, a five-month shoot. Okay, five-month shoot. Cool. Ooh, hey, I'm jumping in really quick to remind you to check out my passion project, Backstory Magazine. You could check us out on a desktop or laptop or read us through our beautiful iPad app. And, uh, you know, if you want to subscribe, we could really use your support as we build issue 42, which is going to be our awesome quarantine read. It is a very strange time with movies not exactly in theaters, in some theaters in different places in the world, but not here in America, or in some theaters in America, but not in every state. So it's a strange time. We have cool Emmy coverage that we're doing for the 2020 Emmys. We have films that are coming out on streaming. We have retros. And most importantly, as part of our mission statement, we publish screenplays that are just awesome, that are unproduced. And we interview the screenwriters about them, still hoping that one day they're going to get produced. So it's just a great resource and a great place for you to have an entertaining read. So there's a lot going on over at Backstory.net. If you've never read us before, you could check us out through our, our free issue, issue 37, our Avengers Endgame issue. I made it free to the world so you can read a full issue and decide if you want to subscribe. And if you would like to subscribe, you could use discount code SAVE5. That's the word SAVE, the number five. And you could do that at Backstory.net. That will save you $5 on a one-year subscription. You know, as a subscriber, you'll have access to our archive, which goes back a little over a year for the moment. And we are adding more to our archive each week or as soon as we can as we publish issue 42. So we're going to eventually get all the issues in there. But right now you can read about the past year or so. Um, and there's, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of good stuff for you to read. So I really appreciate you giving my passion project a chance and checking us out over at backstory.net. But now without any further ado, let's return to our conversation with Matson Tomlin as he discusses Project Power. Well, we are going to get into the spoilers. So podcast oh. listeners and people watching us on Zoom to on our Zoom cast on YouTube, press pause if you haven't yet seen Project Power. Go watch it on Netflix and come back because we're gonna we're gonna get into the spoilers. I think one of the interesting challenges of this movie is yeah, it's a mission movie and you're having different teams after the same goal, but you're essentially doing a three-hander yeah. where you know your protagonists of Rob and Art and Frank are on different paths that are slowly merging together. And I'm curious what the challenges were of writing it in that style. Because, you know, you're, you're flipping from one to the other. They all have the same goals, but that's, that's not an easy trick to pull off. There are, thank you for highlighting that, because that, that was the challenge of the movie, more, more than anything else. And, and when I first started writing the script, it, it wasn't a conscious decision of, ooh, I want to do this thing with, with three characters. It, it's just they all presented themselves to me as characters that needed to be in the movie. And then we got to this point as, you know, we're, we're developing and getting notes from Netflix where the, the spinning plates of when do we see Robin? When do we see Art? How long can we lose Frank before it feels like he's just not in the movie? That balance was tricky and, and always being negotiated. And then not only that, there, there weren't a ton of comps for, for three heroes in a movie. You know, you, I suppose that you could look at the Avengers movies where, where there are 10 heroes in it, but, but even that, it, it wasn't quite right. There, there are infinite number of two-hander movies, but, but something where it's three characters where you're kind of on the ship with all three of those characters and none of them are really villains that you like. You know, it, it, it was a tricky one. And, and so it was just kind of constantly in negotiation. That I mean, you you handled it really well. It, it kept things moving around. I, I'm curious who you think the audience is for the drug power. You know, at first it's kind of dissembled to, you know, it's dispersed to a group of drug dealer types. But by the end of the movie, as we learn more about it, you know, it it has a deteriorative uh, effect on users. And you know, there's somebody from South America that basically is, you know, rich and elite and wants to use this drug as a power grab for their country. So it, it seems like it's not really meant for the streets in which it's, it's meant for the highest bidder to tell us about just the, the giving out the drug, the way they do in the beginning of the movie and what the organization that gives it out expected 
to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it was always this whole idea of, you know, taking this, this pill is going to create collateral damage. People are going to die. People are going to get hurt. And so like, let's feed on a certain population. Like let's feed on people who, who are drug users. Let's feed on people who are going to just like, you know, normal people even and collate our data and figure out, you know, what the, what the pill does, what it doesn't do and try to figure out, you know, I think that, that what the villains are really after right now is some sense of solid ground of, you know, what they're chasing is, I know what this pill does. Like this pill will make you invincible. This pill will make you fly, like whatever the thing is. Um, and they don't have that yet. So what they really need is, is data, like what they really need. So they're using people as lab rats. But then of course, like you don't want, if, if you are a, a secret government agency or whatever, you, you don't want normal people having that kind of power. So then of course, like you take it away from them and then you give it to the people who have the most power so that they can continue to control. And just kind of looking at, at different, different drug ap- epidemics at different power regimes through history, it felt like, Oh, this is, this is the way that things really work where you really, you, you, prey on the normal people to be able to give strength to those in power. And that it felt so thematically rich that it, you know, we were already in a ballpark where this, this feels like it could kind of happen. It's still ludicrous. It's still, you know, people catching on fire and all of that stuff, but, but it does have a foot kind of in the way that, that the system is actually designed. It's it's interesting, you know. Exposition is always the scourge of screenwriting, and you you walk a tightrope here in which it isn't clear always what's going to happen with the pill because there's a randomized effect, and yeah. it you don't know if you're going to blow up when you take it as 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 we see in in some places, and it's never clear exactly the true details of the organization. And, you know, those are good things because it keeps a mystery going. But at a certain point, certain things have to be explained. So, you know, the, the idea of, of, um, of, of art, you know, basically his mission goal is to save his daughter. That's told in flashbacks. What, what were some of the, you know, difficulties you had with exposition? Just briefly, because I have a few more questions to hit you with as well. Yeah, I, I think that it was just always a balance of how much are we going to say? You know, I... I built this Bible that really talked about art from from birth, really, all the way through joining the military and you know where he did his service and what what his units were, you know, and and, and really getting into knowing what this guy's history was, knowing the history of this organization, and then there there comes a point where you go, can we say none of this? Can we get away with just complete mystery? And the answer is usually no. Usually you, you have to give people something. And so I think that for, for all of us, and even, even through the cut, you know, there's, there's probably a lot more exposition that was shot that then didn't end up in the movie because it's kind of that thing of you, you want to leave the audience with a sense of mystery. You want to leave room for places to go in sequels, should we be so lucky? But you also want to feel like you you've had something of a real meal as well. So it's just you know always tweaking. You know where do you want the audience to be in a way so that they're asking questions, but they're also emotionally satisfied. You know, you walked into my next question to an extent. Editing is the last stage of storytelling. What did you learn about the film in the editing room? What was what was a scene you really missed that you wanted to cut out that that you hated to cut out? And what's a scene that you were really glad ended up on the cutting room floor? I can't think of anything that got cut out that I'm I'm sad about on the editing. Okay, fair enough. Def- yeah, definitely in the writing there there were there, there's some character stuff that that I wish was still there and then and then definitely some powers. There were powers that we wrote cuz we had, we just had so many ideas that uh, I I hope sequel worlds we we can get to show some of those other powers because because they're awesome. Are you able uh, to say what any of them are? Teasing? I mean, them? just like a, a really cool, dumb one. It's like, you know, there was this whole thing in, in the, the bank robbery with, with Griff, the Invisible Man, where he was, he was with a, a troop of, of bank robbers. And one of those guys uh, just had acid vomit. And we've seen versions of that, but this was going to be like the gross Cronenbergian of just like a guy leaning over just like, into the floor to like make an escape for them and having it be like, 
it take it takes him like two minutes to like make a hole big enough for this. So just like the 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 humor body horror of that, I I thought was kind of great. Um, scene that I'm really glad is in there. All of that stuff with Art and Robin in the vet, like that that to me of them becoming friends, of of her rapping for him, like that that came out exactly how I hoped that it would, and really makes us fall in love with with them and their relationship. And I'm I'm thrilled with how it turned out. What was your toughest scene? What was the scene that you kept coming back to over and over? And how did you creatively rise to the challenge? Weirdly, the the toughest scene for me was the scene between Frank, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character, and Captain Crane by Courtney B. Vance, where they're in this diner after the bank robbery, the Invisible Man situation. And it's it's the whole, give me your gun and your badge, and... You had to get to a point where Frank would be let off the leash to go have the mission. And to do that in a way that felt credible and of the world and not just totally, totally dumb. And and so it, it took a long time. I think that's the scene that had the most changes and the most iterations and most drafts. And ultimately it came down to oh, they have to know that art exists and they have to know this is the guy that we're after and we think that he is the source of pro- of, of, of the power. Um, that was not always an element in that scene. And without it, it was kind of like, what do these guys think they're, they're after? What do they think that they're, they're doing? So it, it, was, it was a tricky one. I, I know you have a lot of amazing stuff coming out next. So it'll, it, and it'll be interesting to see if Project Power uh, yield sequels or any sort of a series. So yeah. hopefully keep us informed if that's going on. I know you're working on the Bateman about uh, Justine and Jason Bateman um, uh-huh. with Matt Reeves. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Batman, Batman. Um, sure. yeah. I, I'm excited for that. I know Little Fish is coming out this year. You know, you you brought up your your Blacklist scripts earlier and you you said that they were kind of dead. As, as writers' careers progress, you know, the, the scripts, they're still there. Are, are, yeah. Is there any activity on some of your earlier scripts now that that you have all this stuff coming out this year and next year yeah i mean definitely there's there's two in particular that that seem like they could find the path to to getting made um one is the script i wrote called called brosio that i think was on the blacklist the same year that project power was when it, when it was just a script called power and that that script is based on a, a a really wonderful painting by this artist named John Brosio. And it's it's kind of a movie where if the Cohen brothers directed Independence Day, if you can imagine such a thing, which I, I hope they do someday. Um, so so that could end up seeing the light of day. But I I mean just like with with everything, for for me when I'm being a screenwriter, it's my job to write a script and then if it sells to, to help it along to become a movie. And at a certain point, you hand it over to the directors and the producers and the editor, and it, and it kind of becomes this more collaborative thing. Uh, I'm happy when I can get paid. I'm very happy when a movie actually gets made. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, you just do the best you can. Like, it, it's, all, it's all betting in the casino. So, you know, who knows what's going to stick. Well, you've been very generous with your time, and I can't wait to see what you do next. Matson. thanks for being with us. Thanks for hanging with me. This is great. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to screenwriter Matson Tomlin for being so generous with his time to discuss his latest Netflix film, Project Power. And speaking of cool things to dig, if you want to surf around online a little more, I hope you'll check out Backstory Magazine. You can find us over at Backstory.net, and you can read us on a desktop or laptop or through our iPad app. You know, one of the fun things about Backstory Magazine is if you've never read us, you could test drive us by reading issue 37. Issue 37 is our free issue. It was our Avengers in-game issue. There is a lot of great content in it that I know you'll enjoy, and hopefully you'll want to become a subscriber. It's a strange time without movies exactly in theaters, but kind of in theaters, so your support would mean absolutely everything to us as we get ready to release issue 42. And you're going to see us build it live as our Emmy coverage is going to go live next week, actually. So piece by piece, you will see issue 42 assembled. And uh, your support would mean everything. And as a thank you, if you want to subscribe, I'm offering you coupon code SAVE5, which would save you $5 off a subscription. All you got to do is type in the word SAVE, the number 5, over at backstory.net. 
and you will be able to find us there. And uh, your subscription will give you our current issues and an archive of our recent issues going back about a year, and we're going to keep adding stuff to it. So stay tuned as we continue to add old issues to our archive for you to read. But really, your support in these kind of questioning strange times means everything to us. So thanks for considering. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2020. All rights reserved. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.